Space exploration truly brings out the best in us, encouraging people from all walks of life to work together to achieve a common goal, to know the cosmos and our place within it. We are the Planetary Society. Good morning, everyone. Bill and I here, CEO of the Planetary Society. Welcome to Planetary TV. Today, uh, our guest is none other than Leland Melvin, astronaut, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, art educator. There you go. Who, uh, retired from NASA, now educates the world on space exploration. And I would say, Science uh, writ large. Would you agree with that, Leland? I would say so. Yeah, we need to, because it's STEAM, right? It's everything. We need to make sure that people learn a little bit about all things that are part of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, because that's what makes the world go round. And the thing is, it goes around for everybody. Just before we get started, how cool was the Falcon 9 with uh, Bob and Doug going into space? You know, I was I was in the studio down at Kennedy Space Center doing this, you know, this show for the the masses to give them those backgrounds of Bob and the Falcon 9 and all that. But when it was time for it to launch, I ran down to the countdown clock and I shot a video. I've always been told, just look at the rocket, don't shoot video. But Simon Sinek shot video when I told him not to. And I said, hey, that's really cool video. <laughs> so, so I shot the video of this thing taking off and I saw the smoke and the fire and the flame. And when it got up about maybe, what, 500, 600, maybe a thousand feet, that's when the sound came across the water. I know, yeah, I know. I've and been there for just, other launches. It, it just hit me, you know, and I, it, 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 it does something to your soul. You know, you just feel like you're connected with the vehicle. I was, I was, I was speechless. And you've been on top of that thing twice, or yeah, different man. rocket, even yeah. huge rocket. Yeah, yeah, it it changes you, Bill. You know, it makes you it makes you feel so connected with the world when you start seeing the blue dot behind you getting smaller. But then when you get there and you're going around it every ninety minutes, you're connected with all of civilization. That's so everybody says. The, you guys talk about the overview effect, right? right. That orbital perspective, yeah, the perspective shift you get when you look back at the planet. When are you going up, by the way? Okay, dude, excuse me, my esteemed colleague, uh, <laughs> Mr. Melvin. You're You've got to go. You have got to, of all people in the universe, you have got to get your butt to space. I'm telling okay, you. Okay, dude, so I applied four times. I don't play in your league, all right? So... There's Elon, there's Richard. There's... I know, but, you know, when I talk about guys like you, the, the guy shows up with the clipboard. How many PhDs do you have, Mr. Nye? You know, and the first box is A, 100 to 300. <laughs> and then how many marathon, how many, how many uh, Detroit Lions games have you played in? And I have to put zero. So. You got the overview effect, and just for our viewers, listeners, you grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, right? Lynchburg, Virginia. Your dad was a big influence. Yeah, you my a chemist. Well, you know, my my mother, when I was in middle school, even I, no, I was in elementary school, she gave me the agent appropriate non OSHA certified chemistry set, where I created <laughs> the most incredible explosion in her living room. And you know about education and brain activation when a kid gets, you know, their brain gets activated to science. And I think my eyeballs were like this big you know, when I was, I, it was fire and brimstone in the house. You know, the and whole you didn't brain. have safety glasses on in those days. I did not because no. set, oh, non OSHA certified. <laughs> That's <laughs> what we'll call it. Were required. But uh, that showed me how these two dissimilar chemicals could you know, liberate heat and smoke and fire from these little vials. And that just that just changed my life. It really did. And that one gift was uh, was an entree to science. Let me ask you, you know, we got a, I don't know if you heard, we got a lot going on out there. Brother. Uh, <laughs> so let me, let me, let's talk about that. Um, when I was in high school graduating my, my senior year, um, graduation night, I was in a car with my girlfriend after graduation and a police officer rolls up on us 
Um, what were you doing in the car? We talking. were just making out, talking, whatever. <laughs> just, you, and, know. you know, you know, you uh, know. And he he grabs her out of the car, puts her in his. It was a state trooper, so he puts her in his car, and he tries to convince her that I was raping her, because he wanted me to go to jail. And the the crazy thing is that I think about you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now because I would have been in prison, in the prison system. And once you get in that system, it's sometimes very hard to get out of that system. Um, you know, a charge like rape uh, is, you know, and, and he, he pleaded with him. He, he said, if you don't say that he's raping you, I'm going to take you to jail. Your parents going to come get you. And then you're going to have a record. He was trying to, you know, tell her all this stuff that, to make her, you know, say this. And she said, no, I love him. It's my boyfriend. He's going to college on a football scholarship. He's, you know, this and that. She was going to, she was going to college. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't bite. And she, you know, he just gives up and he says, he brings How me in. How long did that go on? 10 minutes? I, you know what? The time, I didn't even have an idea of the time because I, all, all I could see was this going really bad. But think Your about it. experience, you know, as a black man is so different. From yeah, what, it's just, it's just, it's, yeah, I, you know, we I, all got to get our heads around it. I think about George Floyd. I think about, you know, Trayvon Martin. I think about Dylan Roof walking into a church and killing nine parishioners and being able to walk out. No guns trained on him to take him down, whereas George Floyd goes in and he has a potentially has a counterfeit 20 and that's enough to get the life snuffed out of you. Did your par- did your father have talks with you? Hey, you're every, you got to watch out for cops, you're a black guy, just careful. I think every black parent has the talk. We all call it the talk where But it's not just one time, right? It's every week reminding you like careful. There weren't a lot of occurrences where I was in front of the law. I mean, you know, it was a sleepy little town. You know, there's an expectation for people. There's that implicit bias. There's a there's a neighborhood where no one lives that is black. There's a neighborhood, you know, other neighborhoods, you know, spread around the, the city. The 04, the 05, the different neighborhoods where people would be kind of segregated into living because of things like redlining, you know, economics. And, you know, the, the banking industry would not give loans to black folks to get to live in certain neighborhoods. And I remember my father, you know, he is, he got a loan. It was a Quaker person who lived in Fort Hill. And he, he actually was able to buy the house by owner financing. So this guy allowed my dad, he financed the house for my dad without him having to go through a bank. Uh And that, you know, when you think about that bit of access, you know, having, having a home, having a home in a neighborhood that's, you know, where that house is going to appreciate. Think about that, that uh, financial legacy that you're building. If you're in a nondescript area that no one wants to live in, but you're relegated to that area because that's what you can afford and that's what's being allowed. And that's the tradition, that's, right? The red line. Right. Yeah, yeah. Traditionally, I mean, you know, back in the 60s, those those were some of the things that the, it's federal, still the, thing. government, the federal government regulated who could live where with real estate agents. And so, you know, you, you think about all of the the anger and all of the, you know, just one more black person killed by the police. But think about where people are living. Now I'm not the I'm not the de facto spokesperson for all black people. Okay. I know when sometimes we come on shows and talk, you know, people think, well, that's the black guy. He knows what all black people are thinking, which I don't. <laughs> but I've had experiences similar to other people that have not been as fortunate as I have been. You know, my, my parents are both school teachers. Um, you know, we hustled. School teachers don't make a lot of money, but we hustled. I remember my dad drove a bread truck into our driveway one summer, and I thought we were going into the bread business. I'm thinking, okay, Marita bread and rolls. I'm going to have to deliver bread, jump out the side, you know, deliver bread. But he said, this is not a bread truck. It's our camper. We purposed that bread truck into a recreational vehicle. We rewired the whole truck. We built 
bunk beds that flipped out. You're a mechanical engineer, right? So I love know, that stuff. Bunk can't, beds that flipped out. Stop. Machine, you know, Coleman stove and and we transformed this thing. It wasn't until my dad painted it that I realized that his vision for his family. This is where our escape. This is where I was escape pod. You know, to leave Lynchburg and 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 tour the countryside and go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and the Smoky Mountains. And but this was this was how I saw. If you want something, you can have a vision for it. You can create it. You can build it. it and I think other people in the in the neighborhood, other people in the city saw my dad's work ethic. He saw that he wasn't an engineer, but he built this bread truck thing, you know, and well, just to be an engineer to be mechanic. Heavens right. are almost incompatible but, sometimes. But I think just having a vision for something, you know, remember that movie, The Astronaut Farmer? Uh, uh, yeah. well, you mean yeah. The Martian? No, The Astronaut Farmer. It was That's uh, the name of the Billy, film. Billy Bob, Billy Bob Thornton. Oh, uh, yes. He wanted to fly in space. He built a rocket ship. Oh, yeah, ship. yeah, 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 yeah. control, yeah. right? From his farm, right? I mean, and I think that's that's the thing that, you know, you don't have to have a label to do something. If you have a desire and a vision to create something beautiful and wonderful, you can do that without formal training. I mean, with that example, well, the chemistry set showed me that I could be a chemist, right? The bread Oh, right, trial. yeah. Chemistry set showed you you could be a chemist, sure. <laughs> but I mean, but, I, but I'd already done it. I mean, I'd mix these chemicals. This is what chemists do. They mix things together. They create new <laughs> compounds, right? They blow yeah. things up sometimes, right? You make rocket fuel. You blow up rockets sometimes, right? Yeah. Can't get enough. As the science guy, I go to any event, you know, hey, Bill, you're the scientist. Can you blow something up? I mean, that's right. like the second sentence. I like yeah. what you did with that smoke, though, with those rings. Oh, the vortex rings. That and so, you know, the whole thing about those is everything cancels out. In fluids, when you get this pressure going around an orifice, this, you know, the sharp edge, uh -huh. everything cancels out and it forms a ring. In fact, not only does it form a ring, it forms the ring is spinning this way. It's the, the vortex within the vortex. It's just, oh, oh. <laughs> That's <laughs> beauty. Still, still, you're beating hard, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> and what's cool, you know, uh, it's true for everybody, no matter what your background, right. right? The earth goes around the sun, the stuff cancels out in a vortex ring for everybody. Talent is in every single zip code. It just depends on the opportunity, the nurturing, and the belief that that person has in themselves that they can they can rise and do these incredible things. I was telling my niece that, and I was gonna be talking to Bill Nye, the science guy today. She's, an, she's a rising sophomore in high school. And she said, you know Bill Nye? <laughs> I mean, she's- These are freaked, my people. She freaked out, man. <laughs> and so then I pulled out my phone and I showed her the text and we were texting back and forth, you know. Oh my God, you you know. And so she's freaking. And I said, Well, why don't you come with me and, and say hi to him when we're setting up? She said, Oh no, no, I can't talk to you. No, no, no. But your well, impact, I would love to meet her electronically. Yeah, but your impact, man. I mean, it lets kids know that science is cool, it's fun. And and I think I had that in my parents, you know. My parents, they were always giving me little things to do. And like when I asked my dad for a skateboard. He said, hey, we don't have the money for it. Figure it out. And I built my own skateboard, you know. Where did you get the wheels? I bought, well, I got a paper route to buy the wheels in the trucks. But I, mm -hmm. I made the board in the wood uh -huh, shop. Yeah. Those moments of, uh, you know, figuring stuff out on your own and not having to go, you know, someone give it to you. That's what, you know, gr creative creativity and learning is all about. And and experiential learning, right? That's, that's what the astronaut corps wants. People that can build things with their hands and can do. So if the toilet breaks in space, who's going to fix it? You can't call the Maytag repairman to come up there and take care of your, your potty if problem. You gotta you need a, if you need a wax ring, <laughs> you're, you can't yeah. just order it up. <laughs> take a, wait you for know. the next HTV or story used to, you know. Or or now you wait for Falcon 9, man. That's How about cool. that? How that cool is that? How did you so, feel when you saw that thing going off planet? Oh, it's know? just, it's so, you guys, you know, all of my, in, at the Planetary Society, our colleagues have been talking about commercial crew right. 
right. for whatever, 20 years or 15 years. It was where, like eons, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so this is people are get so weird about it. But I remind everyone, NASA has bought hardware from contractors since the beginning, you know, since Same forever. Thing, right? What are you talking about? I mean, you buy rivets from rivet.com or rivet co or we be rivets or whoever it was in 1958. Right. And so uh, you know, the, the quotation is attributed to various people, but Alan Shepard for sure said a form of it. You know, it's comforting to think that we're walking here on the moon on hardware built by the lowest bidder. You know? lowest bidder. Right. <laughs> it's, it's just a great, you're right. So Elon Musk came to the meeting and said, I want to go to Mars. What do I have to do? Everybody said, you got to lower the cost of getting to low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. So that's what his company has been working on for 15, 20 years. They pulled it off. That's good. This frees up money for NASA to do other stuff. It's like stone soup. This is space stone soup. You know, you bring the meat. I'll bring some veggies. Someone's got a stone. Someone's got water. Someone's got a pot. We all put it together and we have space stone soup, you know. And that's, what does the stone do for us? It brings a season. Heat, heat the stone up. The stone gets uh -huh. heated up really hot and that's how you boil it. Oh, okay. Well, was, yeah. I've never made it before, but that's that's the that's the that's story. The myth. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, if you're like me, you're thinking stone rock has a high thermal capacity, so it's right. reasonable. Right. Sure. Yeah. I love but, I love the science nerd stuff, man. <laughs> man it's the best. <laughs> but look, you have changed the world. You have been uh, a representative, an icon of somebody who just got excited about science of a, a non-traditional astronaut background. You know, right. I'm so old, Leland. I watched guys walk on the moon. You know, I was on my knees watching black and white television like that. And those none of those guys looked like you. Right. And that's, why, of, that's why I don't want to be an astronaut. I didn't think about becoming an astronaut because I didn't see someone look like me. I was just, I just posted something about Star Trek and Nichelle Nichols, you know, our friend. Oh, man. So if you guys don't know, Michelle Nichols played Lieutenant Yohura. And she so was right. the first African-American woman in a leadership role on television in the 60s when Star Trek came out. And Gene Roddenberry had this vision of bringing all these people from around the galaxies together on this five-year mission, right? To Optimistic view of the future through science. In the 60s, when people are getting batons split over their head, when dogs are, you know, attacking people you know training them from these these police and when you say people we're talking about people of a certain ancestry but we're talking about people african american black people right 400 years of uh from the first slave ship in 1620 there has been some type of subjugation some type of something going on even until now uh, you know i've been to the um African American Museum of African American History and Culture, mm -hmm. part of the Smithsonian in Washington. It's across the street from the American History Museum. And what flipped me out, really, and I, you know, I grew up in Washington, which in the city, and it's the scale of it. The scale of it. There are more black people enslaved than there were enslavers right. in the in the 16, 1700s, when the Constitution was being written. And it's the scale of it that's just overwhelming. It's just, wow, all these people came from somewhere else, and they were disenfranchised, right. and they still are. They, we, our society is still screwed up in this regard. But maybe, maybe this is a turning point. Do you feel that way? Everybody's talking about it, or is it just more false hope? So... <laughs> You know, I'm I'm an optimist. I mean, if well, you if, got, if you're going to be an astronaut, if you're going to go, I'm going to get on this rocket. Everything's going to be cool. There's but, enough but, energy to disintegrate <laughs> everything. No, let's go. Let's light I mean, that candle. <laughs> if a skinny, if a skinny black kid from a a formerly southern racist town, I mean, there was a lot of racism back then, can go to space two times, anything is possible, right? This ain't rocket science. This is this is really not that hard, Bill. I mean, when you bring people on a police force that are racist, that are maybe and maybe you don't know that, but over the course of their tenure in their job, 
if there are 17 or 18 complaints about their performance, and then you're you're allowed to stay on the force because the union mm -hmm. says, oh, well, we he's he's one of ours. He's he's one of right. us. We 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 can't fire him. And I think they've tried to fire people before, but the union brought them back, or they were shipped off to another district, you know. So mm -hmm. So we talk about bad apples, but there are people that are doing these things, but there are people that are around them that are complicit, that allow that that's to it. happen. Oh, that's but it, it. Well, just Edward, as a voter, I'm complicit. But, but I have What did Edward Burke say? He said, for the, for the triumph of good over evil, no, for evil over good, it's when good people do nothing. You know, you can be a great, good person, but if you sit there and watch and allow that, that atrocity to take place, you are allowed, you're not, you're the, you're a part of the problem. And I think people are now starting to wake up and realize with the three things that have happened, the Amy Cooper thing saying, weaponizing her voice as a white woman. In Central oh my Paris. goodness. That's so weird. There's an African American really down the man. whole force, the but whole about it. force of the did. New York police department in it's in a heartbeat. She she weaponized that moment it, and and it showed you what power she had on this Harvard trained birder. Just <laughs> wants to, he just wants to see look at birds. <laughs> Think about that, knowing that at any moment someone could call the police. That's on, it. And and in that moment, you could get that police officer that doesn't like people with lots of melanin in their skin, and you're gone. You're you gone, as you said, you get in the prison system and you just can't get out. You know, there was a Scientific American article, I think it was in 2013. They had done the research looking at solutions and they said that the best technical solutions come from the most diverse teams. Diversity in gender, race, culture, you know, brain power, schools, you know, whatever, however we want to slice that diversity up. We will get the best solutions. And a little girl, she, she texted me through her father, I think. She said, Mr. Melvin, if there hadn't have been Jim Crow laws and racism during the time of Katherine Johnson calculating the, the trajectories for us to get to space, would we have gotten there faster? Think about all the trauma that oh. Catherine and that whole group oh. of people had to go through just to get to work, just to survive this taken away from your brain power to do the calculations. Hmm. So, I mean, little things like that that are big But they're things. not little, man. They're huge things. Take Ahmaud Aubrey. When I was driving down to the Cape to watch the Falcon 9, the Crew Dragon take Is that Bob, how you got there? You drove? I drove through Brunswick, Georgia, where Ahmaud Aubrey was shot and killed. And and I as I was getting closer, I, I looked at the, I was looking at my map, and I mean, my, my little GPS map, and I'm like, this is where he, this is, this is a bad place, you know, and not everyone's bad there, but that situation was just horrific. I mean, I've gone into houses before that are under construction and looked around and. Oh yeah, everybody I, has. How cool I, is like, this? What are they going to do here? Where's the, where's the, the kitchen going to be? Yeah. 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 And but, the smell, the smell of um, fresh lumber. Ooh. Yeah. The third thing was Brianna Taylor, the EMT, where they broke into her house. Yeah, they thought she was the other apartment or something. Right. They had the wrong apartment. And she's dead, right? Yeah. And then the last thing was the powder keg was, you know, George Floyd. And yeah. and just that whole thing being recorded and, and listening to him. I mean, Bill, I, I started crying. Oh, it's, oh, I saw that and I heard him calling for his mother. He was calling for his mom. And I, I think it, that could have been me. That could have been Bobby Satcher, who first time two African-American men were spaced together, you know, on STS-129. And think about that wouldn't have happened if these other things if could the, have If the state happened. trooper had pressured your high school girlfriend to say the wrong thing because you were yeah, making that on the side yeah. of the road. So, so you have these, like, you know, these things that are on the fence and these microaggressions and these implicit biases and all these things that I grew up with that you have to just, you just have to put it in the back because that's going to incapacitate you. I think about Harriet Tubman. If if Harriet Tubman can escape from the South in slavery and make it to Philadelphia and then come back and liberate even more slaves, 
and be a spotter for she she's done so many things but if she can do that under under that kind of condition i can do anything i mean right on right? Leo. if she can be so such a, a bad butt back then i can go to mars and you can go to space too we can go together i'm well i'm ready to go man now let me ask you this i want to talk about your civil rights work and all that stuff but what do you think is going to happen next here comes SpaceX, Falcon 9's working, mm -hmm. Blue Origin's almost there. Some, they're going to be working this really Blue soon. Blue Moon. I mean, I think we're going to probably be buying by, buying uh, you know vehicles to land on the moon from Blue Origin. If we, SLS comes online at some point, you know, we'll have heavy lift to get up there. I, I really believe, though, I mean, Elon has been powerfully driven to do these things and everything that he's wanted to do he's done with you know tons of failures you know having those rockets well, he accepts them or that company accepts and, and that, is so cool. that is so cool because that's what that's what experimentation is all about right you have your failures and then you they grow to success but you you can't get to success without failure and you want to fail early and often right yeah um, I think we're going to get to Mars, and maybe it's a, a contingent of countries and uh, and SpaceX, and you know, I I think we need to bring all these all these spacefaring nations together. What do you see for the future of the U.S.? We are living through this extraordinary summer, yeah. Where another pandemic has emerged. You know, I say all the time, the reason you're here, the reason we're having this interview is because our ancestors, our, my case, my grandparents, it might be your great-grandparents, lived through the Spanish flu. Right. Uh, and so we have this coronavirus, COVID-19 thing, and it is very serious, you guys. With all these people running around, marching, chanting, yelling, there's going to be the word second wave. It's going to be second tsunami of these people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of people infected and um, and deaths. And so... With that's going on, and George Floyd was murdered by a cop or a group of cops. Okay, so what do you think is going to happen this summer? I think we're at an inflection point in our country, really in the world, with civil rights. And, you know, when you look at the, the numbers of people that are protesting in Australia and London and Paris and all over the world for, for the rights that was this powder keg with George Floyd, I think there's gonna be some type of institutional change that happens with respect to policing and, you know, and the isms, because it's not just racism, it's all kinds of isms that are affecting. Give me us. some more isms. Oh, sexism, uh, classism. I was I gonna mean, say, backgroundism, you know, yeah, ancestorism. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and I think this is a point where the good people who've been sitting on the sidelines saying that doesn't affect me now realizes it really does affect them. It affects everyone and that we have got to make some serious change. I mean, I was driving, I was driving a, above the speed limit here in Lynchburg going up the fifth street bridge. I was going five, six miles over, I get pulled over by the police officer and my heart starts racing. I didn't even realize it. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I just five miles over, right? That's not a big deal. 10 2 position. I'm looking straight ahead. The officer comes up to me and I said, Officer, I don't have any guns. I don't have any weapons. I don't have any drugs. Please don't shoot me. Didn't even look at him. Just looking straight ahead. Don't mm -hmm. shoot me. And he was floored. He was like, Oh my God, what? why would I shoot you? I said, Look, there's so much stuff going on right now. Black men are getting killed by police officers. He gave me a warning. Because he was so shocked that I would say that, but it's real. I mean, all the people that you look at that were stopped for some reason, a lot of them are no longer here to talk about it, or are in prison for, you know, resisting for arrest. Or yeah. I mean, look at Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland made a wrong turn in Texas. She was smoking a cigarette in her car, and the police officer said, "Put your cigarette out." And then he said, "I'm gonna. If you don't do that, I'm gonna light you up." He had power. She had power in her car. She, she, you know, 
but he wanted to take that power and make her cower, make her respect subservient. Him. Yeah. Make him subservient. And that's what 400 years we've been subservient. We've been, you know, oh, hey, you know, we you know, let's build this head, let's do this. And then you get you get the people, the abolitionists, you get the Harriet Tubbins it. <laughs> I'm not taking this anymore, you know. That's she, right. So so we have the Harriet Tubbins out there fighting the fight in the street with the protesting, you know. And I think there's a, you know, a group velocity, right? There was a huge group velocity of people moving towards that same mission of equality for all people. And, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that all lives don't matter. There's a pandemic in the Black community now that's causing our lives to be squashed out. So we have to focus on the Black lives right now. I'm really hopeful about the future. I think about my brothers pointed this out many times. You know, you watch television commercials these days, and there are so many, so many what used to be called when I was growing up interracial couples mm -hmm. being depicted in commercials. And that's because that's who's getting married. That's who's buying cars. That's right. who's buying breakfast cereal. They're not doing it. They're like targeting they're, the people that have the money to buy. That's the, right. They're selling the product to the people who are buying it. The demographic. And they do market research and they respect that research. And so. Uh, they, they respect science, right? As it respects, yes. And so we got to get society to who catch up. That? <laughs> oh, she was. You guys, do you think you must think about that all the time? It just makes me crazy. Oh, well, my God. <laughs> so do you understand the pandemics? It's a virus. The virus doesn't make choices. Exponential growth is what this virus is doing. You go out. I infect you. You go talk to someone. You infect them. They infect someone else. It's just. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And right. if you're a virus and you chance on the way to take three days to have symptoms show up. You're going to succeed as a virus, man. Yeah, it's going to yeah. be great for you. I think this is the way that the earth is fighting back. You know, think about how much less pollution we have now with everyone home zooming across the, the ether instead of driving their car to work. I think the planet is, uh, is, is retaliating a little bit here. Well, here's the thing that is so exciting for me as an educator and the CEO of the Planetary Society, where we celebrate uh, we empower the world's citizens to understand the cosmos and our place within it, if I may quote our mission statement. But what's so exciting is humans are coming to realize that we are in charge. We didn't mean to be. When I was a kid, there were fewer than 3 billion people. Mm -hmm. Now they're almost 7.8 billion people. Right. By the time... Uh, by 2050, there's going to be nine. There might even be 10 billion people by 2060. And they're all going to want to eat and do something. And we'll probably pull it off with all the trouble that's coming. Right. We'll probably feed everybody because we are running the whole planet now, not on purpose. We just ended up in charge of this whole planet. And so we are going to make choices in agriculture, in communications, in commuting. You know, half of our energy goes to transportation. Right. We're going to make all these changes through science. And the people that are going to make it are the people that guys like you inspire, the young people. In every zip code. In every zip code. The more diverse an ecosystem is, the more responsive it is to changes. Mm -hmm. If it gets dry or if there's a drought or it's a wet season, the more different species going on in that ecosystem, <clears throat> the more successful all the species are. And the same is true of design teams, technical teams that you were talking about. The right. more different ideas, you know, this planetary side, we're all about our solar sail. We love our light sails. Very successful missions. Very cool. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was all me. No, it was, just, <laughs> it was decades of people messing around with it. But here's what's so cool to me. When you visit JAXA, you know, Japanese aerospace, mm -hmm. their solar sails, they made the first successful deep space sail, and they're building another sail to go to Jupiter. It's, to me, wow. it's so cultural. Their sails are origami. Really? The they're... 
you know, the way they're designed, they're like, they're but that's all what these you colorful. Know. But, and that's the most that's the most efficient packing too, isn't it? Probably. Yeah, well, and then at the Planetary Society, ours looks like we went to Home Depot. We got some tape measures. <laughs> boom! It's going to come out on a Swiss motor. It's going to be cool, and it worked. And and so the best ideas are going to be. I can see it from here. The best the ideas. Yeah. yeah. So to get the sale the light sail two sails into the package, they're folded in an origami fashion. To me, it looks to me, it looks very much like origami as an observer. Mm -hmm. And so the more people we include, the more successful we're going to be. I'm not telling you anything. You've seen the earth from space for days and days and days. Trevor Noah did a, a nice um God, I love that guy. Societal oh, contract. The societal contract that most people have for how you behave, how you treat people, how you do things. It's different from, you know, for certain people. If you if you go into a situation where you're looking at getting a job, there is an implicit bias that people look at you. They say, okay, well, he's probably not smart because he's got dreadlocks or he's just whatever that bias is may keep you from getting that job or your name being Rashid versus Jim. And this has been proven that resume is coming in with the same exact, you know, same same lettering. If it's Rashid versus Jim or, you know, Tiffany versus LaQuisha, yeah, yeah. you might not get the job. And they've done those studies. The same thing with, if I'm strapped with an AK-47 walking down the street, police officer sees me, I'm face planted with a gun in my head. Mm -hmm. If it's you, they may come up and have a conversation about, mm -hmm. well, I know Where'd it's okay. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, you might not want to carry this around, but I could be dead. So that, that, bias that's keeping us from having the best solutions, I think is going to have to change so that we can solve some well, of these. Do you think it will change? Is this inflection point that's going to happen? I think this is, but again, 400 years, we have the civil rights movement, we had other movements before now, but I think the whole world is protesting. I mean, it, it looks different to me, but New Zealand's having a march for quite a while. Yeah, New Zealand is <laughs> marching away away. with Black Lives Matter signs. You know, when when Michael Collins, Neil and Buzz, when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon and Michael Collins was looking down, taking the the ultimate anti-selfie, he's shooting the picture. He's not in it. Everyone else in the world is in it. And Neil and Buzz are on the moon. When you think about when they came back home. It wasn't about America went to the moon. It was all of us. When they went to Russia, when they went to Ireland. That was his big quotation, yeah. Yeah. It was like we were their astronauts too. And I think we need to get to a point where all of our emissaries, all of our ambassadors that look like me, that look like you, that look like Naoko from Japan, that – these ambassadors that are exploring out to the cosmos, when they come home, they're able to tell the story of this inclusive story. I mean, when I was on STS 122, it was African American, Asian American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander, breaking bread at 17,500 miles per hour while listening to Sade's smooth operator. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, you know? Smooth, smooth operator. <laughs> But you know, but having you talked about perspective, you talk about letting people see these perspectives in all the zip codes. Let them see what's possible when you have diverse teams. As a leader of the Planetary Society, ensuring I saw where you're going, you're having a movement now, your own movement at the Planetary Society, making sure that you have diver, a diverse workforce there. You know, we're and, we had, we're diverse-ish, right? Right. We're a small organization, but we're really going to work on it again. Uh, I mean, well, because that's when things start to really change. That's because when we get ideas. That's, yeah, that's economics too. People have a job. You know, people are employed. They can take that back and get their kids to college. And all of these systemic things that have been put in place from the '60s, even before the '60s, to keep people from having power from having money, you know, from having a house in a nice neighborhood that you'll be proud of, that will appreciate, and you can use that equity. That's, it's, it's economics too, right? right? So Leland, 
if you were in charge, as I like to say, if you were king of the forest, like the cowardly lion there with his fabulous song, if you were in charge, what would you do? Is there a thing? Is there a set of things that you would insist on? I think, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a policymaker. I'm a I'm an informed citizen right now. I've retired. But you're that. also a leader. You're a leader, a leader man. Yeah. I, I think I think the thing, the one thing that we all have to have our own introspection and reflection is what am I doing to help and what have I done to hurt? And that implicit bias, we all have our own biases. Have has your bias made you be biased towards someone else? Because you know, we can all have our own, you know, because we, we talk about from local to global, we talk about self-care versus group care. If you can figure out what you're doing negatively to contribute to the problem, everyone that's listening to this can go home and really soul search. Am I a racist? Am I a sexist? Am I what am I doing to jack other people up? And then <laughs> take take well, that away, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, am I am I a nice person? Am I Am I not hiring people because of the color of their skin or because of their gender or because of their orientation? You know, am I not creating a diverse workforce because of things that I don't want to have in my my place of work? Um, so that's that's the first thing. The second thing is, if you are in a leadership position, you set the tone for what's expected and what what is is what you can do. The rules of the road and your organization are this, and if you violate that rule. You may have one, depending on what it is, you're fired or you have a probationary period where you got to get through this. If you do those things, starting with yourself, then and you figure out what you're doing to cause problems. And if everyone does at the seven point, what, eight billion, seven point three billion. So it says uh, seven point six anyway, going on seven point seven. Seven point six yeah. billion oh, people heart. had the little talk with themselves. And let's say. 10%, 20% aren't going to have the talk and they're racist, sexist, whatever, then the leader doesn't hire those people. You know, you affect them economically. They don't get jobs because they have had a history of being that way. And and there has to be some kind of union reform also because the unions are- In the police department. Not all, yeah. But in the police department, at least, they're, they're allowing people to go from violations- to other organizations or get their job back. Mm -hmm. And 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 actually officers know that. And so I think that's why Derek Chauvin was just sitting there, hey, nothing's gonna happen to me. When he went home that night, there were 75 police officers protecting his house, right? I mean. It yeah. bugs you. So. Could have been me, brother. We, we may not have been having this conversation if things were different just, when I was in just, high school. Just, I was on the fence, right? Just, 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 on the precipice of this little, you know, and my heart goes out to everyone, the Floyd family, all the people that have been brutalized, been damaged, been traumatized, um, you know, all people, black, white, what, whatever, but especially right now with the way that I'm feeling and I have means, I have a home. So the people that don't have these things that are even feeling more trauma and, and don't have a way out and don't have an escape, I, I feel for you. And uh, we got to get well, this. We have, we have the treasure. We have the wealth in the U.S., in the world. It's if we just – it's not distributed properly. I know we got to distribute it again. We got to capitalism, it. though, right? I mean, everyone's trying to get their piece of the pie. Well, and we we are a capitalist society. So here's uh, for you to consider, if you got time. I say all the time, the guys who wrote the Constitution of the U.S., which became a model for constitutional governments around the world, they were nerds. They wanted to build a government that would that could adapt. Built into the U.S. Constitution is change. And so what you want, it's like a machine. You machine, you want all the parts the machine needs and no extra parts. 
And the vision is to have all the laws you need, all the regulations you need without any extra regulations. What we need is a few more regulations. We don't have quite enough now. But this is, gotta, this is no, no, this is the whole point. The Constitution started out as a lie because there were only two or three that didn't have slaves. So you were starting this. Bring this on, man. Bring it on. Document with as a as a big lie experiment. And so that same Constitution that we've had, the, the laws and rules that we have, there's a part of society that those rules don't apply to, and there's a part that they do. So that's what Trevor was saying. There's a societal contract that's different for certain people. So if you if you do the right things, if you go to the right college, if you do, you know, you'll move up the ladder. But for some people, if your name is this and your resume gets submitted, you don't get the job because of your freaking name is too ethnic, it's too cultural, you're too. You wear braids. Oh my God! You can't wear braids in the workplace because it's not, it's not white enough, right? Women are getting fired for wearing, excuse my French, right on braids. Right what on. What is up man. with that, Bill? It's wrong. This, this is like, this is beyond the pale. In huh? Virginia, the Lovings, they had to go to D.C. to get married. When they came back to Virginia, they got arrested for Across the get river. married. Getting married. Loving Let's each other. It. Let's fix it. What are your biases? What are your, I mean, everyone has their stuff, right? Do that soul searching. Do that figuring out. You're a leader. You're a leader in the scientific community. You're a leader at the Planetary Society. People know you intergalactically. Hey, there's Bill <laughs> Nutt. My niece. I, I mean, love it, niece, man. My niece does not get it. She doesn't get inspired by a lot of things. I mean, she's inspired, but but she well, doesn't she's got like you. Yeah. Well, gosh, I'm Uncle Leland, so I don't count, right? But it's like she heard I was talking to you and she got it's excited. Cool. It's that cool. blew me away. And and now I can use that to my advantage. Can you say hi to Sierra for me? Sierra? <laughs> Sierra. <laughs> Sierra. Say your uncle's cool or something. <laughs> Sierra, it's Bill Nye here. Your uncle's the coolest. He's the man. Thank you, man. I love you, man. No, no, you're the man. So, Leo, let me ask you. You must get hit on to do interviews like this every five minutes, right? Ten times a day, somebody must call you. So, because people are trying to understand what's going on and you know, they call their black friend, right? Because a lot of times people don't have a lot of black friends that they care about, trust, whatever, whatever, for whatever reasons. I'm not judging or anything. But again, you know, one of my astronaut buddies, I said, you know, you need to do the research. You need to you need to really understand why people are so effing angry. Why are they angry, first of all, so that you can at least try to empathize because you're not, because you're in your space, you got your stuff. You know, oh, those people, oh, they're, 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 they're making a lot of noise. This, uh, yeah, yeah, the police must be right. They, you know, they wouldn't do that unless they were doing something bad or something wrong. But now the camera phones show that they are doing wrong. They're doing bad things, some of them. And so you got to do your work. You got to do your own internal work to see why this is going on. Talk to your black folks that have gone through some stuff. Talk to people, talk to other people that maybe are racist, that discriminate and ask them because you have an access access to them that I don't have because of the color of your skin. So maybe figure out what is going on through their head. What happened to them that made them adopt these ways? And, and maybe you can say, hey, no, 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 those black folks didn't do that. No, 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 you've got that wrong. I mean, we have science, people in science don't believe in science. People believe, believe that the earth, this thing, it's flat, right? <laughs> and people question me about that. Well, is it really, <laughs> well, it wasn't a disc. Well, 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 did you go around the disc part? Is that what you saw? Oh, I mean, come on. Well, we say come on, but there are people who genuinely question. But you can, but you can talk to some of those people where I couldn't because they're racist and they will never believe a black. Oh, man. I see. Oh, yeah people that you could sway based on the color of your skin. It's and and where the good people do something, 
versus being complicit and saying, okay, well, that's that fringe group. That's that. We got to talk to everyone. So Leland, to this point, people are asking you to, to talk, to testify every week, right? All the time. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. But let me ask you seriously, why did you agree to talk to us, to the Planetary Society? Because you are a friend of mine. I like you. But this, this ability for what the Planetary Society does to make life in the universe better for all people, right? Through exploration. We're all in this together, man. All in this together, right? And, uh, and I think that, that forward-looking vision past you know, our blue marble because one day, if we don't act right, our blue marble may be gone. We may use it up, and we may need to go somewhere else. A green I mean, I, marble. I don't, I don't want to have a plan B. I want to fix the plan A now. Yeah, that's okay. it. But there's going to be a turning point. And I right. wonder if this misery with George Floyd, I wonder if this is going to be a turning point where, like, we all are we all are in this together. There is nobody who's not being affected by this. I think the two I think the two things with COVID-19 and George Floyd, the the synergy around those two things happening, you know, in the same space are really making people reevaluate, you know, how we go forward. What does that new normal look like, you know, from a civil obedience, disobedience to uh, how do we live our lives with masks and how do we educate people like what we're doing right now? I mean, the education system is going to be turned on its head because of what about if COVID-20 pops up, right? Uh, <laughs> COVID-21. I mean, we, we have a vaccine for 19 and then 20 pops up. I mean, you know, and it takes a year to get that vaccine At done. least a year. Yeah. We're oh, back yeah. to this. And then how do we educate our kids? Well, I think about it all the time. The other thing I think about, though, I watch my neighbors, you know, here in Southern California, and kids are outside. They're riding bikes with masks on. It's a little wacky. Right. They're riding around, and uh, they are experiencing the environment in a way that I think everybody— Never done it before, yeah. Right. Because of everybody being on his phone or her phone like this. It's going to be different. And, you know, what do we talk about all the time in science education is hands-on, right? Experiential learning. Kids in my neighborhood are having, right now, before it's really gotten bad where you're falling way behind in conventional school, right now they're having experiences that I think are actually good. Mm -hmm. uh, they're giving them per perspective. I am so old. How old are you? I'm so old. I remember when polio was everywhere. <sighs> so you couldn't go swimming. In Washington, D.C., in the summer, I'm not telling you, it's freaking hot and humid. Right. Right. And, and so this is when I really got interested in bees. I started watching bees because huh. I was home. You couldn't go. Anyway, did you – you had a, a couple times I've been with you, and you've had to go, I can't hear out of my left ear. I got to do this, right? Because right. you injured your ear in the dive tank, right? In this Monty laboratory, the five million gallon pool that we train as astronauts to do spacewalks in the EVA suit that looks like a Michelin man, like a Pillsbury yeah. Doughboy. Sometimes you need to squeeze your nose. Yeah, to we all do. Yeah. I, but not everyone, because some people can they can just uh, yeah. jaw and yeah, clear the whole salvia maneuver. Yeah. Right. I can't do that. I have to I have to press my nose like that. And I got to do a combo. I got to do, do both. Yeah. And so in the in the suit, the helmet, there's a little styrofoam block in front of your nose called the Valsalva device. You poke you your, head your nose yeah. again, and that, that lets you squeeze your nose off and clear your ears. Mm. Well, the technician forgot to put mine in. Wow. And and because you change it with each astronaut because it's a hygienic. Right, right, right. It's right. not so in the thing. Right. Yeah. And and when I did my fit check where you get in the suit, this is before you even get in the pool, you get in the suit and you figure out, you know, your hands were reaching this and you look mm -hmm. around and my Valsalva pad was in my helmet there and I pressed my nose against it, making sure it was in the right place. Because after this whole investigation happened, he said I never requested one. And so he lied on the investigation. Uh, but anyway, oh, man. 
anyway, but I went down oh, and wow. I didn't have a way to clear. And I didn't feel like my ears were so stopped up that I couldn't keep going. So, so what they did is they, you know, when you go down and you come up a little bit, it helps relieve some yeah. of the pressure, like you, you know, going up in an airplane, you, your ears open up versus when you come down. And so we went down to about 10 feet, then we went down to about 20 feet. And I told the test director to turn the volume up in the headset because I wasn't feeling pain. I mean, I, I was just, I felt like, you know, I could still function and do it. And then I heard nothing but white noise and static. And, and then I felt myself being pulled out of the pool because I guess they were calling me and I, I wasn't responding back because I couldn't hear. And when I got to the pool deck, the, they took my helmet off and the flight surgeon started walking towards me. And he's talking to me. He's, I see he's moving his lips. I am just think he's playing because he's not saying anything. And he touches my right ear bill and he pulls his finger back and blood is flowing down my face. Oh, man. I, I am completely deaf. And they don't know why it happened. They did surgery. They operated. They looked around the stapes, the, mm -hmm. all the, the, the yeah. oval and circular windows in the inner ear mm -hmm. that relieve pressure. They thought they were leaking something called a perilymph fistula. And mine were both intact. And so they, they didn't understand what was wrong with me. So when they don't understand what caused the problem, you're medically disqualified to fly. So did it heal? So this is, this is the, the quandary. <laughs> this... This ear came back with the speaking frequencies. So the frequencies that you have conversations, um, the left ear, it's so far down. I mean, I have some response in the very, very low frequencies, but anything for speaking or anything else is pretty much gone. So technically I only have a very small band of, of uh, frequencies that I can hear in my right ear. And you really need both when you're in space because if alarms are going off or people yeah. are trying to well, plus say, your hey, direction, you're uh, right, right. Because right. when I think you were over here talking to me, I had to immediately turn and look at you this way so the sound mm -hmm. waves can hit this ear right here. But the thing that really surprises the the audiologist is that I can hear and communicate much better than my testing shows because they would have thought that with the level of hearing that I have in my right ear only, that I could never function in an environment with noise. You know, like we were talking about hearing aids, you know, that mm -hmm. they can be directional, they can pull mm -hmm. things from far away. I don't have hearing aids, but I feel like my body has compensated. You know, we have other sensors on our body. Our heart is a big sensor, right? I mean, it's beating for a purpose, but it's sensitive to and I don't know if this is if this is true, but I feel like I have evolved and can pick up sounds from other other transducers, whether it's wow. skin, whether it's the, the big heart, organ, whether it's organ skin, yeah. whatever it is, something is allowing me to function without hearing aids. The body is incredible at compensating for you know losing things. We're all playing the hands we're dealt, but we have so much in common. We have so much. So much more we could do, and uh, but you're reminding me that that you got to be reminded continually that yeah. we've got to work on this continually. In our spaceship above the planet Earth, if Yuri makes a mistake, if Peggy makes a mistake, if Leland, if Dantani, if Steve Frick makes a mistake, we all die. We're getting to the point now on our planet Earth where if we keep doing these things and we decimate the planet and, and people, the same thing can happen here. So I want that life off planet to be a model that we adopt and bring back down here because we get over our differences in space so that we don't all die. You know, that's <laughs> that's the power of working on a team in a critical environment, but our earth is a critical environment too. Our planet is a critical environment that we have seen how we've decimated it. You know, I, I saw the Amazon forest burning from space, you know, deforestation for cows, for meat, for palm oil, for our popcorn, or, you know, just the stuff that we are consuming. 
just to take that piece, if we don't work together, we die. I mean, that's that's what we've seen with all of this brutality. We haven't been working together. 400 years, we haven't been working together, you know, with everyone having the same style. And you know, I could have ended up like that cop. I could have, the same set of circumstances could have happened to me. Right. You know, growing up, people flew the Confederate flag. Right. Well, get this message out and uh, and do that internal to external reevaluation. And as leaders, you know, stomp out. Don't be the good people that are complicit. Stomp out this this violent scourge of people that are doing these horrific things. I don't think it's it's not everyone. It's not even fifty percent. It's not even probably oh, thirty. No. It's, it's probably ten percent. Maybe one yeah. percent. Who, who I don't know. I haven't done the. I don't have the data sets. I don't know the number. But you know, as a manager or whatever, one five percent of the people cause ninety five percent of the problems. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. One part goes wrong. The whole thing doesn't work. But anyway, Leland, thank, thank you. you. His book is I Chasing Space. <laughs> 20 in a carton. They make great gifts. It is really <laughs> well written book, man. It's really fun. That's it's cool. And, and thanks for putting your John Hancock on the book, too, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You guys, you know, you asked me to write a blurb, of course. Yeah, it's on the back here. Uh, it's on the inside cover. Yeah, absolutely, man. Hey, Bill. Yeah. Godspeed on the journey, brother. Godspeed. I Thank can't you. wait to see you getting your perspective on looking back at the planet. You It'll want to give me a ride? I, I'm working on it. I'm working All on right. it. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm of a certain age, but I'm compared to people my age. I'm pretty fit. John Glenn went to space 77. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite that. I'm ready to go. I applied. This is great it. to see you. Blow it up. Blow it up, brother. Boom. Let's change the world, man. Let's do it together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's go.